Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Healing and Freedom Journey. Mark DeJesus here. I am your brother from another mother, bringing you insights along the way. I'm all about mental, emotional, and relationship health. So if you are too, you have arrived at a great place. Today, I want to delve deeper into the series on what is grace. And in the last broadcast, I brought out the understanding of how performance and perfectionism wars against the work of grace in your life, in your journey. I pray you get a hold of that and let it have a marinating work in your life to set you free and to help you to understand the power of God's grace. Two things that have been so incredibly life-changing for me in my mental, emotional relationship world and my journey has been the love of the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to root my brothers and sisters deeply into it because our battles often reflect a disconnect to the power of God's love and his grace at work in our life. And so I want to help tune your senses more and more to the power of God's grace. Today, I want to get into an enemy of the work of grace, and it infiltrates a lot of thinking and a lot of patterns in our life. And a lot of ways in how we relate to God and how we respond to ourselves and how we relate to the struggles that we're going through. And it has to do with condemnation. And today what I want to do is bring out some discernment for you. Because I see such a mass problem of believers being underneath the oppression of condemnation. And you don't have to be. But it's going to take some unwinding. It's going to take some learning and relearning. And I will hope that you'll have some light bulbs go off in your discernment today to help you to learn, man, I've been under the influence of condemnation. Maybe you didn't realize it. I know in my life, condemnation, if I was to look back at my journey, most of my life growing up into my adult years was heavily influenced by condemnation in its various forms. And I'll get into those. And as I began to learn how to discern what was influencing my thoughts and the toxic areas that I lived under. One of them was fear, for sure. Like, wow, I lived most of my life. I'd say probably 90% of my thoughts were influenced by fear. And I had to do a lot of unwinding of that. Another layer that was so helpful was realizing condemnation, which comes in the form of shame and toxic guilt and cycles of regret and accusatory thoughts and things like that were having such a major influence in my Christian life and journey. And I didn't realize I didn't need to be underneath the assault of that. I didn't realize that I was actually listening to something called the ministry of condemnation, which I'll get to in just a second. But I'm praying that what I bring out here will will help you to get some illumination. And in my previous broadcast, I did a lot about the law and helped you to see the law has an influence today in what could be called performance-driven Christianity and Christian perfectionism, which performance should not be tied into Christianity. Perfectionism should not be tied into them. But nonetheless, we're influenced by those factors and its law base, its law influence. The mindset of the law is enforced by the work of condemnation. It sets a set of strict laws that can never be perfectly held and then condemns you for falling short. And many of you are realizing that you followed the ministry of condemnation. The Bible actually mentions this. I want to talk about the ministry of the gospel of grace versus the ministry of condemnation. And yes, there is a ministry of condemnation. It has offices. It has a phone number you can call. (laughs) Uh, It's very much in operation today to hold you back and block you from being able to receive the beauty of what the grace of Jesus Christ is doing and seeking to do in and through your hearts and in and through your life. Second Corinthians 3, 9, Paul mentioned this. If the ministry of condemnation, which was tied to the law, it had glory, meaning it had some, it had some influence, it had some, some uh, weight that it brought. He says, if that had any kind of glory, the ministry of righteousness, which that is the work of what Jesus Christ paid for in the cross and resurrection, 
delivers to us the work of grace, which presents to us righteousness based not on anything I could have done or ever could do. It is based completely on the work of what Jesus Christ did for me. And Paul says that the ministry of righteousness, this exceeds much more in glory. And so why is the why is the law, why am I tying that into the ministry of condemnation? Because when you are condemned, it reveals you are living under the influence of law. And when you live under the influence of law, it's a trap. And it's going to set you up for condemnation. It's going to set you up to stay in bondage. Many believers actually need to realize they're struggling and being set free because they're actually in a loop of condemnation that keeps them in that loop. And they never actually break free because they're still under a law influence in trying to get free. The ministry of righteousness is going to lead you into understanding grace. It's going to lead you to understanding compassion and a relationship where you experience the beauty and the glory of who Jesus Christ is, who said he wants to show you the Father. So there's beauty in this, and out of that is where we're changed. But so many of us have been used to a heavy-handed, performance-driven, get-it-all-right kind of preaching, teaching mindset, and we're detoxing from it. Some of it has been downright abusive, to be honest, because it's kept people under bondage, which is how the Pharisees lived. The Pharisees took aspects of the law, and they add even more to it to put weight on people. And these burdens they put on people, they weren't even following themselves. So the Pharisees were the group that Jesus was the most hostile to (laughs) and, and had made some very, very strong statements towards was because of what they did to the people. And many of you are coming out of the, the shackles of that and you're actually manifesting more freedom uh, from bondage, more freedom from sin. And you're also recognizing too more freedom to just live and move and have your being, make decisions, and become empowered in Christ to step out in faith, uh, to stop being under the the oppressive weight of double-mindedness and spinning in confusion and oppressing yourself, becoming an enemy to yourself. So many areas that uh, freedom in Christ is is bringing out for us. But let's get into discerning condemnation because I want to help you understand what's at work. That many of us can go, hmm, that's what it is. When we talk about condemnation, we first have to talk about religious legalism and law. We could call it Phariseeism. We could call it a lot of things. Maybe just religiousness that um, has no power to it. In order for you to understand condemnation, you, you, you have to realize we got to bring law into the picture because once a believer relates to God primarily through a set of rules and get things right, you're entering into a court of law. And when you enter spiritually into a court of law, you now empower the accuser of the brethren. And the accuser of the brethren is a legalist and he's a prosecutor. And he has a long list of shortcomings, sins, mistakes, weaknesses that he wants to throw against you. And you'll be tempted to argue and debate back and try to make yourself feel better and try to land somewhere within this. And you're going to see, and, or maybe you need to see, that you're still getting black and blue in this fight because you're trying to win from standpoints of the law and not, not recognizing you need to shift the whole dynamic of how you're even interacting with how you see yourself and how you see God. So religious law and legalism is, a, is right at the top of the list. Then there's accusation, which Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So he seeks to keep condemnation going in operation by bringing out accusation to accuse, to point the finger with the hopes that you'll do that to others and you'll do it to yourself all day long. There's infused within this a fear of punishment. Fear specifically is a part of this, but it lends into fear of punishment because you're afraid of God. It's not a fear of the Lord. It's you're afraid of God. And a lot of Christianity is terrifyingly afraid of God. So approaching him 
is very, very intimidating. So they often avoid the whole idea. Intimacy, connection, those kind of things with God are very intimidating because you have become so aware of your flaws and sins. You haven't seen the beauty and majesty of Christ, what he did for your sin, what he did for your inability to achieve or try to land in righteousness. There's also shame, which uh, we see shame all the way back to the Garden of Eden. At uh, Adam and Eve's first response was shame in the midst of the awareness of their sin. And um, it calls for shame is a, a, a revelation. It's revealing that we need a revelation of the grace of God, that we're actually needing to see ourselves through a different lens. If you recognize you struggle with shame, of course, I have a whole series on that. I have a whole series on guilt. Shame and guilt do a number on believers to keep them from their confidence, to keep them from being able to see their journey soberly with uh, God's perspective. They get hammered under constant accusation and reminders of their flaws and failures in a way that steals your confidence. So then there's this judgmentalism slash punishment, because that's what condemnation does. It's pointing to a judgment and punishment, which, which then lends into the sense of contempt. You can have contempt for other people. You can have contempt towards yourself. Many of you are realizing, wow, you have a very poor relationship with yourself. And to be honest, the church encourages this in a lot of circles, encourages this you against you. You're your own worst enemy. Uh, I want to call that out and say it's anti-biblical. So sorry. Uh, God's not called you to be an enemy to yourself or to take on this attitude of contempt towards yourself. And many believers have historically lived that way and call it godly. And it's not, and it's not bearing fruit. It's made us more harsh to other people, more judgmental. We're not manifesting the fruit of the spirit because we've been taught that we should live in contempt. And uh, I love helping people to be set free from that because Jesus didn't die on the cross and resurrects. You could be yelling at yourself all day in this self-hatred spiral. But um, then there's the sense of criticism, of fault, fault finding, of looking for flaws. Could be yourself and other people. So as you can see, you package these all together. It's going to, it can look spiritual. You see this full package. There's many churches I could visit right now that live in this full package. They quote scriptures um, and, and, and they teach and preach and people go, yeah, amen. And, and they come out with the letter of the law. And the Bible says the letter kills. It does. It kills. It steals. It erodes your life. It, 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 it kills mental health. It kills your emotional life. It kills your relationship. It kills your confidence. The Spirit gives life. So you can always, you can always see where there isn't condemnation at, in operation, there's more life being breathed into people's lives. There's empowerment that's taking place. Grace is given more room. So so you'll have, to, um, you'll have to recognize um, these things at work. Now, when we look at to condemn, the, the, the word meaning, you're going to see those words I just mentioned. I have them in parentheses here. I'll break this down another way. Is uh, First, you see the shame factor expressing strong disapproval of someone. That's an aspect of condemnation, right? You're just looking, and there's a shame approach in how you see them. And usually, it's you see people through the lens of their mistakes, sins, weaknesses, struggles, bondages, whatever. And don't we typically do that in how we relate? We see people through that lens. So what it does, it pushes back and blocks from the ability to see through covenant, to see through the eyes of grace. Because when you see through the eyes of grace, you start to see things more the way God sees them. But shame wants to keep that sense of disapproval towards others. But towards yourself, how many of you, you, you have a strong sense of disapproval when you look at yourself? Um, placing a judgment upon someone and passing a sentence with punishment following. So there's your judgmentalism and there's your punishment-based relationship. It can also mean con condemn, condemnation can also mean to know something against someone and accuse. There's your accusation, right? And uh, many people carry a a a ongoing spirit of accusation on their thoughts. It's just an atmosphere where they're just so easily accused. Uh, to pronounce guilt against someone, again, it's with the pointing of the finger. To think ill of someone, there's your contempt. Now, look up the word contempt in the dictionary. Many of you are going to realize that 
you often have this kind of relationship with yourself or maybe even towards other people. Contempt is the feeling that a person or thing is beneath consideration, worthless, and deserving of scorn. Let me say that again. The feeling that a person or thing, let's focus it in here on, on what people battle. The feeling that a person is beneath, it's like you're bad, ah, just look down on you with contempt. It's like an arrogant, hateful, ugh. You've experienced that maybe from people. But how many of you actually do that to yourself every day of your life? Where you feel you're beneath consideration, you're worthless, you don't have any worth, you're unworthy and deserving of scorn. So then when hateful toxicity comes your way, it can actually feel normal. Whereas when love arrives, it feels so abnormal, so foreign, so strange. Grace seems like it's just too good to be true. You also have the fault finding. So you look at yourself from a place of criticism. You may then look at others this way. And condemn means to exercise law against someone. And part of the freedom in Christ Jesus is going to be infused with understanding. We're going to have to let go of trying to stand in a court of law and win the argument. The Bible speaks of dying to, we have died to this. Like, I'm not going to stand in the court of law and try to sit here and win the argument. I'm going to instead die and let that, let that whole thing deflate. We're not even going to, we're not even going to try to, to put air in those tires. <laughs> no, we're just going to let that die because there's a new me now in Christ that I can experience because of what he paid for that settles the debt. And my response to that is absolute gratitude. But you're going to need to know there's a war in the heavenlies over us being able to receive this. And a big part of it is the mission of condemnation. And the mission of condemnation seeks to trap you in a spiritual walk where your life as a believer is under the influence of, first of all, performance and perfectionism, because that's going to then get the law in there. And this will trap you into feeling disqualified from God's love on a regular basis. You're going to struggle in knowing what love is, what his grace is, what his mercy is. A constant pressure will rest on your shoulders to, to do better, to get it just right. Yet it leads to further bondage, all while repeating the cycle. Condemnation presents a religious path. It's going to keep you bound to a rule-based mindset. But that rule-based mindset is something you can never fulfill. It's going to create a set of standards you can never meet, and it will always remind you of your shortcomings along the way. It sounds abusive, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what the enemy's trying to do, to abuse you and block you from the freedom that Jesus Christ paid for. Meanwhile, it's going to disguise itself as guidance, as God speaking, and if you're not discerning, and this was me, myself included, this, this will steamroll and become a part of your lifestyle. Now, let me give you some symptoms that you're living under a work of condemnation. And I think for many, some light bulbs are going to go on. Is on a regular basis, you just struggle to feel free. And of course, we don't live by our feelings, right? But I just, you just, on a, a regular ongoing basis, you don't, you don't just feel free that freedom in your life. And when I talk about freedom in Christ, I'm not just talking about just freedom from sin, although that is very much a part of the atoning work and the grace uh, work of Jesus Christ. I'm talking also about freedom to live and move and have your being, the freedom to make decisions, the freedom to have joy, the freedom to experience relationships, the freedom to do things out of a decision, just loving people, not because you're under some bondage and you feel compelled and compulsive and you just feel free, right? It's a big sign you're under the influence of condemnation. Another one is you rarely feel right with God. You just always have the sense of you got to fix something, repent some more, you got to ask for more forgiveness. And a, a one that, uh, this one is really stands out, number three, is you have trouble thinking about or talking about your past. And that's a sign that condemnation has a grip on your past. It's infused with shame, guilt, accusation, 
that causes you to lose your confidence. Instead of seeing your past or your struggle as a part of the journey, as a part of what you're learning, as God's helping you to overcome, but you can't, it's so hard to even talk about it or even think about it. You're held hostage by your mistakes and sins. And many of you have asked for forgiveness and repented and it's still just over and over again, just still hitting at you. You have a punishment-based, uh, fear and punishment-based relationship with God. So you do things out of a sense of, oh my goodness, God's going to punish me if I don't. You carry a sense of disconnect with God, which that's rooted also in a work of rejection. I have a whole series of materials based on exposing the rejection mindset. But there's this sense of disconnect, of separation with you and God. You've said yes to Christ. You follow Christ. You follow his ways. But when it comes to prayer, worship, or just connection, there's just always that ongoing sense of chronic disconnect. And in that, there's a hyper awareness of your sins and shortcomings. So it's, I, I just don't feel close to God. Rejection gets in there and condemnation gets in there and starts to, first of all, the lie is that there's a separation. That's a lie. Because he said he'd never leave us or forsake us. God's not this like, you know, I'm here and then I'm gone kind of thing. We created that. That's a man-made thing. I, have, I don't feel close to him. I, I feel close. I, I am, we've done that. We've created that uh, under interpretation of what the enemy's told us. Because there's a sense of separation. We believe that lie. And then there's a second lie. The second lie is what you did to deserve that sense of separation. So what it is is hyper-awareness of all your sins and shortcomings. That's what it is. That's what it is. So then you try to fix those things. So you try to look for rules in your spiritual life to then fix those things. And then we continue the cycle over and over and over and over again. And so I can see this when somebody's like, okay, Mark, so tell me the three things. Tell me the things. So these bottom line rules that they're trying to look for. A sign of condemnation is you spend the majority of your prayer life and interaction with God trying to clean yourself up. You're often looking for ways to relieve yourself of guilt. And you're constantly in, in that's your basis. It's like you're, you're in a relationship where you're constantly apologizing. And have you ever been in a relationship with somebody that just keep apologizing? Hey, sorry, 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 sorry. And you go, stop apologizing. Just, can you just be, just be, but they're in a guilt based world and it's hard to get them out of it unless they see that. Right. Another sign is you, you struggle with feeling disqualified from being used by God. And God has gifted all of us as believers with giftings. He wants to use us to bless others, not in pressure, not in, oh, I got to do this or I'm going to be punished. Actually, out of delight, because your giftings often link into areas of passion, often into areas of uh, uh, things that you think about that you'd want to be a help to. Everything that you see me doing here is out of the grace uh, gifts that God's given me. And that, that link into passion and relationship. I get to do this. I don't have to do this. And, but we could easily be very easily feel disqualified from being able to be used by God. Now, I know there's certain qualifications of elders and people that are in certain uh, places of authority in the body of Christ, certainly. But whether it's you're in that or you're, you're wherever you are, we can feel so disqualified because of the struggles and battles that we have. At even at microscopic levels and how we analyze things. You're quick to judge, shame, and condemn others. Now, some of you, you're very much, you do this to yourself, but you really work hard to not do it to other people, right? You may, you may abuse yourself all day, but you're like, I really try to not do that to other people. Or you're just honest, you do both. You beat yourself up, you beat everybody else up. Your lens becomes judgment, shame, condemnation. It's your kind of your default setting. You may be a rule oriented person. You see everyone through rules. Uh, you develop a critical eye or here's a, here's a litmus test. If you hear of another Christian who's fallen or had a falling out or something that, that, that uh, big struggle comes out, what's your first response? You know, is it, yeah, I got that coming to him, you know, or is there a sense of empathy and sobriety? Hey, I could, I could be in that very same battle myself. Um, my heart goes out to him. I pray for God's grace and his mercy, right? When we're filled with condemnation, condemnation becomes our go-to response. 
The biggest sign that you are under the influence of condemnation is you struggle to receive because condemnation is a receptivity blocker. Condemnation is seeking to block you from receiving grace, from receiving compassion, from receiving forgiveness, receiving mercy, from receiving compliments. If someone just says something loving and kind to you, you can't receive it because you're so aware of your own flaws or even just receiving gifts in general, unless, unless there's something you feel like you got to earn it. And it's a struggle to just receive. And in my work, I teach a lot about learning to receive from God. Say yes and amen to what he says about you and his love towards you. But we do so much fussing, don't we? Because of what condemnation has conditioned us in. Now, I want to help you discern, and this is the meat of today's broadcast. I want to help you discern the influence of, of condemnation and I'm going to give you some markers we're going to walk through one by one. And I'll give you some scriptures, but I'm going to try to put some, some handles and, and, and discernment markers to help you to be able to go, okay, I need to get some renewal in my life and detox some of the influence of condemnation in my life. First and foremost is God's heart for the whole world is not to condemn it. We got to start there. His heart for the whole world is not to condemn it. And this is found in, in John three seventeen. Many of you know 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world with the intent to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved, that in his love, that they'll know that he loves them, and that in that they'll receive it and have salvation. So God's heart for the entire planet is not that it be condemned. Got to think about that for a moment, right? Now, we know scripturally that there is a condemnation to those who absolutely, with everything that's been given to them in their life, they absolutely firmly refuse to receive Jesus Christ. They reject him in every way, shape, and form. And, and the Bible does say they're under the influence of a, con- a condemnation journey. But for you and I who've said yes to Jesus Christ, in the new covenant with Christ Jesus, God does not use condemnation to speak to his children. Again, God does not use condemnation to speak to his children. And many of you are going to need to take a journey of detoxing this. And it's going to take a journey. It may take weeks, months, years. And that is okay. Because religious leaven takes time to get out of your system. And even when you get it out of your system, you'll have to learn how to be aware of it. Because it's a toxic poison that seeks to sneak its way into every area of our life. Condemnation does not come from him. It's not a tool that he uses with us. Condemnation is a manipulative, it's a relationally manipulative tool. Because I accuse and use guilt and shame and I get you into a state where you feel uh, so terrible and I give you a bunch of rules you're going to follow to try to get yourself out of it, but you end up staying in the bondage anyways. Paul said with absolute declaration, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. When I said yes to Christ, I am now in him and I have a new me, a new identity. And my focus now is on the radiant beauty of the righteousness in Christ Jesus. And as I look to that, I am changed by it because who he is is at work within me. Condemnation wants to shift you over to staring at your sins and be aware of all your flaws all day long with a incessant work of trying to fix yourself. And that really trends in modern Christianity. Constant trying to fix yourself, trying to fix yourself. And we bypass being loved beautifully by the Father and the grace of Jesus Christ and his work that is seeking to be at work. So who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. Now, 
I see, I see this preached, you know, many, many, many times. There's no condemnation, but you got to finish the sentence because you, because you, you walk after the flesh. It, it, you, it, it's, it's for those. There's no condemnation if you're walking in the spirit. And what they mean by that is walking in the spirit means you're doing what the spirit of God says, and walking in the f- and, and and you're not walking in the flesh means you're not doing anything that's wrong or sinful. And I think that that is a misrepresentation because it. It, it um, inflames self-righteousness because if the definition of this is you walk by the spirit means you do everything just right with God and the flesh means you make a mistake or you sin, then everyone's going to be under condemnation and you deserve it. So they put this twist on it, right? That, oh, you got to finish the verse here who don't walk in the flesh. Oh, you see that thing you did wrong? You were in the flesh and that's what it's meaning. The flesh is the old you, and the old you seeks to find righteousness by your good works on your own. Paul said, here's things I want to do, I'm not doing them. Here's things I don't want to do, I find myself doing them. What conclusion did he come to? I've got to break out of condemnation because because I'm walking according to the Spirit, which means my reliance is not on the old me trying to find righteousness on my own because the flesh is tied to the law. The flesh looks to the law to try to be justified. And Paul said, there is nothing in my flesh that's good. He said, nothing in me that is my flesh. He said it, put a parenthesis there in Romans 7. He's like, there's nothing good there. So why am I trying trying to get that going and try to be a good boy today? Right? So I feel Romans 8, 1 is often taught inaccurately. There's no condemnation because I've said yes to Jesus Christ and his righteousness. That's now moving in the spirit. I have a new identity, which Romans 8 tells us, Romans 8, 14 and 15. uh, If you're led by the spirit of God, you're sons of God now. So there's a new identity has been given. So if you call me by my old identity, and let's say my old identity uh, name was Frank. Sorry for any Franks out there. (laughs) But if my old name was Frank and you say, hey, Frank, I don't have to answer to that. That's not me anymore. Now, um, it doesn't mean you can't talk about your past. You can't talk about your struggles because in Christ Jesus, we could talk about whatever. In fact, the more you get free in grace, the more you can actually soberly talk about your past and your mistakes soberly and help others go, yeah, I, I did those things. Yeah, that was a part of my journey. Yep. But you're not bound by it. You can be at peace knowing what God has done in your life and in your journey. And so many can't because of the work of condemnation. See, the, the flesh is going, to, is going to try to get you to get into right standing with God. To get back in his good graces, whatever that means, right? That's a parenting thing. You try to get back into good graces with your parents or get into good graces with a person, right? That's not good graces, that's, that's good working, good works. Trying to, if I do this, I'll, be, I'll feel better. And then we feel a little bit better, right? We get, a, we get a little bit of an endorphin hit, but it's based on a lie. It's based on I did this good, and so then it creates a, a deceived pathway of trying to earn God's love and approval. You see, when it comes to, when it comes to someone who's struggling in sin, do you know it's easy to condemn them? It's easy to yell at them. We live in a day and age where preaching today is at an epic level of yelling and condemning at people. And we think the more we yell, the more we scream and holler at their sins, and the more we really hit and hammer with them, that's going to set them free. And we go, amen, amen. We high five each other. It's actually lazy Christianity. Do you know it's lazy? It's lazy. I'm going to call it that. It's not only false, it's lazy. Because you can easily point a finger and tell someone's faults. You can turn that finger and you can look at your own fault. That's easy. It's deeper. You want to get deeper, biblical and deeper. It's deeper to roll up your sleeves and go, all right, let's grow in relationship. And along the way, we're going to let Christ Jesus do his work as a work of the Holy Spirit. Do a work of transformation in our lives as we learn to be loved by him and live in his grace. It's a whole deeper thing. I want to see believers who know how to love someone through 
their battlegrounds. Now, they may not receive it. They may not take it in. But we have been conditioned under this browbeating, hitting people over the head kind of lifestyle. We've actually been infusing condemnation in our teachings to people, keeping them bound. People under your teachings should be gaining more freedom, and the biggest fruit of it is the fruit of the Spirit, which is relational. Now, how many scriptures they have memorized, how many arguments they can win, or if they can, if they can preach a fancy sermon. Do they have fruit, in, and not even fruit on the, uh, sometimes we look at the platform, because that's where we look. Uh-uh. In the, that pastor who's yelling and hollering, I want to see, how does he talk to his wife? Is there fruit there? How does he talk to you? How does he spend time with his kids? How does he relate behind the scenes? That's the fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. What Paul called out the works. Because we live in the, what we call living in the flesh is really living the old you trying to get righteous on your own. That's really what it is. And guess what? It either makes you self-righteous or uh, the works of the flesh come out the envies, the jealousies, all this stuff that it lists in there, out of what? It just inflames sin. So I'm going gonna, do, gonna to do a whole talk on what is the flesh anyways. Because I, I feel like people, ter- they throw that term out. Oh, you're in the flesh. We can't do anything in the flesh, right? It's like, what does that mean? What are you even meaning? Because many times what they mean is like, you can't do it in the flesh. you got to be super religious and praying all the time and speaking in tongues all the time. And you just can't have any thought that comes through that's, that's not perfect. And you can't make any mistakes. That's in the spirit. It's not. It's false teaching. It's false teaching. It's not. In the spirit means I'm plugging into the reliance of what Jesus did. And I'm reminded of his love and his grace every day. And I live out of that. And my life is each day as I'm maturing, I am more and more and more relational. But we have cultivated a sin-obsessed kind of mentality in how we see people. Condemnation, I'll tell you what, it's going to beat you down. It's going to leave you there. It's going to leave you there. And you can see, if, I, if you look at your church, how many people are getting more and more free. And a year from now, you see glowing change in how they relate. They're more peaceful. They're more kind. They're more patient. No, what you see is people that know more about the rules, that know how to hammer people. And you see people still stuck in the same cycles, same cycles. The people of God today, many are under the, the slavery shackles. And like in Galatians where Paul says, you've been bewitched, you're under shackles, but we stay in the same cycle. And Paul says, you're not slaves, your sons get free. You got to get out of this. But folks, when we're used to bondage, we stay in it. We stay in it because if I condemn you, I can manipulate you. And then I can get you to be afraid. Ah, if you get out of this, oh, God's going to come after you. I can do all kinds of stuff to abuse you and keep you in the abusive cycle. And Paul's saying, get out of that abusive relationship and get into freedom, whereas Christ has made us free. And don't be entangled with that yoke of bondage, because that's what it is. Grace meets you in your sin struggle and walks with you into freedom. Condemnation says, you got to get right before you come in here. Condemnation's fuel comes from the law. That's where it gets its strength. That's why it's called the ministry of condemnation. And it's in modern performance perfectionism. Performance perfectionism. When you engage the ways of the law, the ways of God, I'm sorry, when you engage the ways of God from a law-based influence, you're getting back into a spiritual court of law. The, the accuser of the brethren comes as the prosecutor. He pulls out the book. He's got thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of things against you. An endless list, folks. It just keeps scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. His social media feed of all your flaws has a never-ending, never-ending scroll. And you jump in, try to fight, and you try to to defend yourself. You're going to lose every time because you're in the accuser's court. And God, Jesus Christ, did not pull us into the court of law. He paid the penalty. 
This is why many of you need to learn how to shift your response to the accuser of their brethren because you're spending there trying to argue and debate all day long and then another argument comes and then another argument comes and another argument comes. I believe we need to die to the arguing back and shift our stance on it is written and get ourselves rooted in the righteousness in Jesus Christ. So condemnation is going to, however, drive you to obsess over your sin. Grace shows the strength of God's love and power in your sin. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. It gets, it shows its strength. And Paul said, now, should we sin more so we can see that strength manifest? He says, of course not. If, you, if you, that's where you're going with it, and that's where a lot of people go. They go, if I get free in grace, I'm going to become lawless. And Paul even called that out. No, uh, certainly not. That's absurd, and you don't understand grace if that's where you're going with it. But condemnation is all about relating to you based on your flaws. It becomes a primary way of operation. Grace knows the power of Jesus Christ works in relationship. God does not change you from a distance and then bring you in. And many of you in your journey, you're trying to change from a distance. God, I'm working on it. Hey, God, you're yelling at him. And God goes, nope, come here. Walk, journey together. And remember, grace is going to point you to a journey. What Jesus Christ was a finished work on the cross and resurrection, but you and I are walking in what that means. Okay, I'll get to more of that in just a second. But grace, uh, grace shifts. We're not obsessed over your flaws. And people say, well, you're going to compromise. And there are those. There are those who will take this beautiful grace and try to cheapen it or try to um, move into accepting the ungodliness and things the Bible clearly says is wrong and sinful and say it's okay. Yeah, there will be those. And they say, well, that's cheap grace. No, there's no such thing as <laughs> you take the word cheap and put it with grace. Sorry. Grace is grace. That's not grace. That's cheap deception. <laughs> That's what that is. Grace has the ability and power to be able to see somebody in everything good, bad, and ugly. You ever been around somebody who's gracious like that? It seems like it's rare, isn't it? it seems like it, isn't it rare to find someone who just manifests the fruit of the Spirit and responds to what people are going through graciously? We live with such angry hostility and argumentative and just harsh people. They're just ready to just condemn you. It takes a whole different level of understanding compassionate grace that really shifts everything. A great example that comes to mind is when Jesus is at the, he's talking to the woman at the well. It's really interesting because he says, uh, he says, hey, go, uh, go call your husband and bring him over here. First of all, he shouldn't even have been talking, shouldn't even have been talking to her. So that was already, you know, the, 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 the cultural divisions that were taking place there. But in addition to that, hey, go call your husband. And the woman says, I, I don't have a husband. And Jesus goes, yeah, yeah, you, you've said it well. You don't, you, you have five husbands. And actually the one that you're with is not your husband. So, okay. And he just moves on. Now, is Jesus saying it's okay that you're living this lifestyle? No. Some might interpret that. Oh, he didn't, he didn't call her out on it. He needs to call her out and say, you got to repent of this and take place. And mo many modern Christians would go, okay, we got to stop and we got to deal with this right now. No, he just moved on. And she was amazed by his prophetic insight. And then he led her into talking about those who will worship him in spirit and truth. He brought out an emphasis of what God is doing and the righteousness work in Christ Jesus. That moment brought change to her life. And I'm telling you, that lady walked in transformative work. Now, he could have been like you and I are sometimes, where we obsess over whatever's in front of us, somebody's sin or somebody's issues. It doesn't mean that we don't bring out sin and we don't talk about it. We obsess today over it and we jump on it 
We don't know how to let the Holy Spirit do the work. We don't know how to build relationship first. And in relationship, God brings things to light. God brings things that we work through because we develop this ability to relay out of his love and out of his grace. You could easily take that scripture and be like, whoa, Jesus didn't even, uh, wait a second. Like the woman caught in adultery, Jesus didn't sit down and go, okay, we got to work through some things because you got some sin in that you got going on here and we need to break this down. All he did was just break the condemnation off of her. And then in that said, go and sin no more. She gained power of freedom over sin simply because condemnation got booted out, including, and that includes shame, guilt, and all that. So what would happen in your battlegrounds if we shifted the environment to grace? It's uncomfortable, right? We want the rules. Tell me the, just, just get, just, just get it over with and punish me. And grace comes in and says, walk with me. Walk with me. And many of you, it kicks up against all your references of not understanding the power of that unconditional love that says, I'm here. Come, come near to me. Come near to me. We fuss and because grace rolls up its sleeves in our messiness. We don't. We hide our messiness. We run from messiness. We hate messiness. We want law. At least law, I go, yeah, I'm kicking you out. You're done. You're done. You're done. You're done. We disqualify people left and right out of our lives, right? Ha, there we go. Ha, I, I, right. It's deeper work to, to live in grace. To go, ah, what does patience look like right now? And many of you, what I'm speaking to is how you relate to yourself. Because you hold yourself in contempt of court all the time. And I'll pull you out of that. Condemnation is, is going to present a way out of sin through works. You got to do this thing, perform. But it's not going to provide long-term freedom. Because condemnation shames you in your sin. And when you get a shame attack, you have a knee-jerk reaction. You panic. And you go, what do I got to do? What do I got to do? And you try to do a bunch of things to make yourself feel better. But it doesn't set you free because you actually don't see things with sobriety. When we see, we're aware of sin in our lives. We have to see it with sober lens. Sobriety means I see how it affects me. I see how it affects other people. I'm sober about it. I don't rush and quick just to want to feel better. I want to see it the way I need to see it. Sobriety will also let you see a little bit more towards the heart of what's going on, of why you battled this in the first place. But instead, we rush in fear and shame and panic, so we, we rush to feel better. And we do compulsive things like pray, oh God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. We do a bunch of Christian activities. We're trying to feel better, trying to feel better, trying to feel better. We don't know how to get in sobriety and go, okay, God, thank you so much that you love me right now in this. You love me, and I'm not going to rush to the next thing right now. I need to know what it's like to be loved in the midst of my awareness of sin, that you love me in this, and you're right here. That's what compassionate grace does. It brings an embrace to relationship. You see, many of you are panicking. You have an anger battle, right? And you panic over it, and you never get to the heart of why you struggle. Grace leads you into why you have that anger battle. That's going to be a journey. You're going to have to work through some brokenness. You may have to revisit some memories. You may have to do some, maybe have to go into some therapy. Or maybe you may have to get some feedback from some people. And you may have to work through and practice new ways of, of relating. Many of you panic to your, to your sexual battles, your pornography battles, and you never get to the heart of what you're actually battling Grace will show you actually why you have those sexual battles and the need to be loved and your stress really, the traumas that you've had growing up, the lack of equipping and, and areas of pain and how you deal with emptiness in your life. Oh, that takes work now. Instead, we go, just give me the three points and just, just we, we, we panic react. Grace is going to walk us through relationship. The influence of condemnation is going to cause you to confuse justification and sanctification. Justification speaks of right standing with God through our saying yes to the work of Jesus Christ of the cross and his resurrection. 
Sanctification is the ongoing continual work of layers of sin being peeled off of our lives as we learn, as we grow. And each year from glory to glory, we encounter the beauty of Jesus. We encounter his nature and and we come into alignment with it and how we think and how we operate. And we begin to turn in new ways and new patterns. Your relate Your way of relating enhances. The number one way you should see Christian maturity is how they relate to people grows. Plain and simple. That's the biggest metric. I am tired of all the other metrics that we make to be the metric of Christian growth. How many scriptures you know? What position you have in church? Who cares? Do you know how to relate to people, how to relate to yourself and others in a more fruitful way where our lives are enhanced? The invisible God makes himself visible through healthy relationships. Now, going back to this, condemnation sufferers, they see all their battlegrounds through a justification lens. What I mean by this is because of this issue, whatever it is you're fussing over, that whatever you feel disturbance about, my standing with God is at stake. So you panic and you're trying to get yourself back into right standing. You're like, God is doing a sanctifying work. Would you just let the work and process happen? But many don't have a solid justification teaching. You know, they hear, they hear in church, well, if you're not sure, if you're not sh- sure you're saved, then I'm not either, you know, kind of thing. And, or, um, you know, we, we, we treat, I'll say it from this standpoint, for me growing up, I felt as though my standing with God was very fragile. It was this delicate glass thing that if I bumped it, it would shatter. It may, it, it, it it's like God is so insecure. And if he looks at any of my flaws, he's just going to be disgusted with it. But God, in Christ Jesus, God sees you through his son, gives you an identity. And that's the power of justification. He loves you. He sees you as righteous in him. And you know what's awesome? God operates in faith towards you. I don't know if you knew that. Did you know God operates in faith towards you? He has a work of faith that he knows in calling you righteous and and operating with you according to that, more of it's going to build in you. Because how you relate to someone is going to bring out those traits. So if I, if I keep telling you how terrible you are and you're good enough and all these things you do wrong, and that's my focus in relationship to you, that's what's going to keep happening. God operates in a realm of faith that he knows that who he is and who Christ Jesus is in you is going to manifest more and more and more. And he believes that what Jesus did is what you need to finish strong. That's how he talks to you. If you want to know how God talks to you, he talks to you from that standpoint. We go to him and go, no, God, I don't know. I can't do it, right? And the enemy hits us on the head, puts his boot over our head. But I found that many people, they, when they go back to the beginning of their faith, it wasn't a strong revelation and understanding of the beauty of the love of God that while you were a sinner, he loved you. He didn't love you because you said yes to Jesus. While you're sinners, God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And I realized that my foundation in Christ was not rooted in love and grace. Does it negate my salvation as a kid when I said, no, it doesn't. And this is why we have to give room for process because you're continuing to learn what you said yes to for the rest of your life. I'll be 80 years old still learning the beauty of what I said yes to when I was four years old. And then I went through many, many years of ask, asking him all over again, getting resaved and, and repent and trying to do it all over because I, I compulsively got to try to fix this thing. Now, condemnation is going to attempt to present itself as God's correction but it's a counterfeit. I've done a lot of talking about this about in past episodes about what conviction actually looks like. I've got resources and all that. But I find that in order to get a glimpse of what God is doing in your life, you're going to have to detox fear and you're going to have to detox condemnation because condemnation is such a counterfeit. Much of what Christians say today, and when I hear Christians talk and they say God was really convicting me or I felt God was showing me or the Lord was showing it, If I was to put a percentage to it, 
I would say about 80% of what I hear from Christians. I'm like, that's just condemnation. You're, 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 you're attributing that to God. It's not. Listen to how they're talking about it and listen to what it produces in them. It usually produces more fruit of perfectionism and performance. I got to do more. I got to do better. I got to do more. I got to do better. That's the fruit that shows. Uh, and, and even online, there's a lot. And when, I, when you read about like they, they compare and contrast conviction and condemnation. And, you know, sometimes they'll say, well, um, well, true conviction is going to lead you to repent. Well, I'm sorry. I see a lot of Christians heavily under condemnation, and they're repenting over and over and over and asking for forgiveness over and over and over. It's a whole different realm to recognize God loves you even in the midst of the awareness of your sin. Unconditional love is very uncomfortable. And grace is not afraid of your messiness. In fact, for me, I have cause and concern if I meet a believer who is not humbly aware of their weaknesses and brokenness. You can just kind of see it over time. I go, A, I can't relate to you, and B, you might be dangerous because you're just going to condemn and shame everyone. Conviction, if we want to talk about conviction, conviction is based on relationship. I've done a whole teaching on what conviction really is. It's not what's typically presented in Christianity. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's primarily a work of reminding you who you are in Christ Jesus. That's conviction. It's reminding you of his righteousness in you and reminding you of who you are. That's what God's doing. If you want to tune into what God's doing, he's reminding you of who you are, and he's building that within you. He's not obsessively here trying to point out every flaw and everything in you. That's the accuser. That's what he's doing. Conviction is also something we should be doing with each other. When you look at the word conviction in the scriptures, it's actually a work, a, a, a large percentage of that word's usage is how believers should be talking to one another. We should be bringing conviction. And so most believers go, we should be calling out sin. No, we should be reminding each other who we are in Christ Jesus. Call it out, remind them, because when you, re, when you know who you are and you're reminded of who you are, behavior flows out of that. Plain and simple. And it encourages sobriety within us. Condemnation, it, it'll bring a list of facts, right? And you'll think that's the truth. No, facts, according to the Bible, facts and truth are not the same thing. And this is what I mean by that. You can bring out facts against anyone about their past, their history, what they've done. The truth, you can identify the truth because it sets you free. You shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. What God does leads you into more freedom. But we're so used to being condemned, we become gluttons for punishment. Yeah, that sermon really hit me hard. You know. Now, it doesn't mean in church we shouldn't exhort and bring some strong words that have uh, passion to them. But we have to understand God has a powerful way of leading you into greater manifestation of his righteousness without condemning you. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need it. There was a, a conversation I had just in the past week. I was explaining this to somebody I was doing a, a session with. And it was funny because the example I brought up, he goes, actually, that happened to me. And I was explaining, I said, you know, like, you get that sense as a husband, he's married. I said, you know, as a husband, you kind of go, you know, I think I need to be more patient and, and, and kinder. And how I, how I talk to my wife, I've been a little bit edgy. And I said, you know, that kind of thing. And he, go, and he goes, man, you know what? That's amazing because I just had that sense in my heart this past week. And I go, okay, there you go. What did it do in you? And he's describing it. You know, I just, it was like, I got tuned into my love for my wife and I got tuned into, hey, how I realized how I was affecting because I was in some obsessive spin outs and, and it, was, it, was, it was, I was manifesting irritability and, and you know what? I, I, need to, I need to love her because I do love her. And it was a reminder of love. I go, see, that's, that's what I'm talking about. When I talk about what God is doing, you weren't sitting there going, woe is me, I'm terrible. You weren't spinning in a cycle. It was an awakening, an illuminating. You were awakened to the power of who you are and you moved into it. And you actually operated in a realm of repentance because you were leaving something and 
stepping into what love said, and now in that, the fruit of the Spirit's manifesting, and you're actually doing the first ministry every man, every husband should do, rather, and that is ministering to your wife and loving her. That's our... (laughs) We've not been taught that's our first ministry. We've been taught our first ministry is our calling and the people out there. But condemnation is going to yield to get your attention. And that's why condemning preaching gets a lot of traction. And it does on social media because it's got that quick hit of something that's shocking, right? Condemnation is going to wear you out. It's going to wear you out. And you know what it does? Many of you have been under religious ritual of condemnation so much, you're numbed out. You've been numbed out by powerless religiosity. And now you're numb and you're beating yourself up for being numb. Oh, I must not love God. And, and, and you need what, what Paul said in his Galatians writing, which I'm so grateful for. Get out of that yoke of bondage. Get out of that slavery. Get out of that oppression. You're, you're being pulled back in it. Now, with the influence of condemnation, you're going to become an accuser to yourself. You become an enemy to yourself. You become a critic to your own life. Many say that they're their own biggest critic. I'm in the business of setting you free from that because God's not put that on you. You basically become an enemy to yourself. And condemnation will, it'll train you to become preoccupied with shame and guilt, your head down, rather than welcoming, gratefully welcoming his righteousness by grace. In other words, you end up staring at yourself. Condemnation keeps you staring at yourself and your flaws so you lose sight of Christ. So you become preoccupied with trying to feel better, trying to get rid of the guilt, trying to get rid of the shame. And then you'll be pulled into distractions. So you won't see what God is doing, what God is leading, because you're distracted by what condemnation is pulling you into. It's also going to drive you to look for rules in dealing with God. And you're constantly trying to fix these rules. And rather than simply coming boldly to him, before the throne of grace, which the Bible says in Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly. Condemnation steals that confidence, as it says in 1 John. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Here we see it. Let us come boldly before the throne of grace. Go ahead. Go ahead. Get up there. When, when my, my kids were young, uh, in, actually, actually within the past uh, couple of years, uh, they, they say, I want to get, uh, I wanna get uh, a candy apple. I want to get some ice cream. And I'll give them some money and I'll go, go ahead. I remember one time my daughter looked at me and go, she was a little nervous. I go, yep, go up to the counter, say it confidently and ask, make a, go ahead, make your request. And that's what Jesus is telling us. Go to the father in my name. Go ahead. Price paid. Go boldly. And we go, eh, yeah, but I got, right. That you may get what? You may get a whooping. That you may get yelled at. No, you may obtain mercy. Mercy is God's compassion for us in our suffering, in our sin, in our struggle. Thank God for mercy. He loves me within all this mess. Thank you so much for that. To find grace, there's your grace, to help in time of need. Condemnation is not going to want you to connect to that. It's not going to allow you to see others through the lens of love and grace too. When you allow condemnation into your life, you're going to become condemning, accusing, and judgmental towards others. When I watch people who are very condemning and accusatory in their words and actions, I know a person who within their life and their own heart is deeply entrenched in a self versus self battle. What they're spewing out, they, they're, they're in an inner world of torment and they're just projecting it out on other people. And we, I find the more gracious that I am towards my inner world, then it naturally flows out and how I will see other people. It's just, it's just, just how it works. But condemnation is going to keep you in black and white living, leading to you obsess about your flaws and live under that perfectionistic pressure. Black and white thinkers, if you have that, you're, 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 you're under the influence of condemnation. It doesn't leave any room for process. It just like cancels you out. You get canceled. And it accuses you and finds a way to just cancel your journey. Paul said this great statement in 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, the more that I get in my heart 
Jesus, I want to know you for who you really are, not necessarily for how other people have misrepresented to you. I want to see in your word. I want to have eyes to see, ears to hear who you really are. Behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. What does that mean? What it means is as I get an aspect of who Jesus is, ah, you read a, a, one story and it just hits you in a certain way, right? And it, it, you experience it. It has an effect on you. That's a glory. Because now it's having a work within you. From glory to glory. Again, another moment where I see Jesus in a way that impacts my life. What's that? That's a, by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of God is at work doing that in you. The condemnation is going to you know, keep you in black and white thinking and not going to let you be able to experience this more. It's going to beat you down so much that you're going to think, speaking of black and white thinking, you're going to think if you walk into freedom, you're going to become lawless. And that's a sign that you've actually been so deep in the ditches of the bondage of condemnation. But uh, condemnation will, it influences believers who become legalists, right? Who think those who walk in true grace are wimpy and don't have high standards. You'll see that. They'll shout out, we need holiness, this love of God business. They, They talk down. I'm always aware of preachers that talk down about the love of God when Paul said it's the greatest. It doesn't diminish the holiness of God. It doesn't push it aside. It doesn't compromise it. But without love, the, even the concept of holiness is something you'll run from. And without grace, you'll try to make yourself get in some place where you can even get to the holiness of God. Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. Listen, Condemnation hates the grace, mercy, and compassion of God because grace comes in and disrupts the religious perfectionism, the legalism, the law, and the Phariseeism. In fact, it makes the Pharisee in us angry and upset. And I hope that you've gained some insight for your journey and for those around you in a, in a, in a, in a fruitful way. In fact, if this has been a blessing, please do me a favor. Click that like button. Click the subscribe. Go over to markdehesus.com where I've got more broadcasts on the subject of grace, more resources. You can go to my topics page. There's all kinds of materials on healing and freedom and what it looks like in mental, emotional, and relationship health. I'm also building a healing and freedom community, an online community of people who want to, they, they, they really want to jump in and roll up their sleeves and work on their journey on the life of the heart and experience that with others. But I leave you with this, these closing words. I pray that you'd, you, you're able to see condemnation. In the next broadcast, my plan, Lord willing, in the creek don't rise, is to now talk about the journey of getting out of condemnation and into grace. And it's going to be found in Romans 7 going into Romans 8. And I'm going to break it down and walk you through it. But condemnation does everything it can to prevent you from seeing through the eyes of compassionate grace. And over and over again, I'm teaching my brothers and sisters the power of compassionate grace. Grace welcomes the love of God and the power of God. And grace opens the door for you to experience mercy. Grace brings an invitation to receive the Father's loving embrace, to experience his kindness, his goodness, and his patience. It opens our eyes to see the Father's heart for us and how a father and who he is as a perfect father, how he sees us. Condemnation is going to accuse you all day long. And he's going to remind you of your flaws and get you to chase down what it's pointing to and distract you and send you on rabbit trails. But, you'll, but it'll just block you from getting plugged in to God's amazing love for you. So you'll be set in these constant fixing modes When we break free from condemnation, one of the first steps is realizing, God, I want to say yes to the love that you have for me. I am loved by you right now. And I say yes to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's mine. I'm going to stop fussing and I'm going to start saying yes to it and learn to just keep landing in that yes. One step in front of the other, learning to be loved as I love others as well. 
If this was a blessing to you, would you do me a favor? Go to martesus.com, click on that donate button and a uh, one-time donation or become a regular recurring donation would be fantastic as you feel led and as the overflow of grace happens in your life. It's an honor to be a brother from another mother. Lord willing, the creek don't rise. I'll be back with more insights for your healing and freedom journey. But in the meantime, I'm out.